And as the rubber band vibrates at a different frequency, it changes into a neutrino. It changes again into a quark. In fact, all the hundreds of subatomic particles that we've seen are nothing but different vibrations of the same string. So physics is a hard Michio Kaku, in his Stephen Colbert interview, gave us a great explanation of string theory, explaining how every particle, think of an electron, is a vibrating string. Change up the frequency, and suddenly you got a different particle. Maybe it's a neutrino, maybe a proton, or whatever. Why some frequencies work, I don't know, but that answer is surely hidden in mathematics. Now, my thoughts kind of line up with Kaku's, though I reckon it's the entire fabric of space itself oscillating away at different frequencies in different places. With this concept in mind, let's rewind to 2018, when a team of researchers from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, UK, decided to delve deeper into this idea of sound and vibration. They took on the field of acoustic levitation, and their findings? Well, let's just say they're pretty compelling. By carefully controlling the acoustic waves, they could suspend small objects in mid-air and move them around. They demonstrated that the principles of sound and frequency we discussed could indeed have practical applications. The scientists used ultrasonic speakers to generate an acoustic field that could counteract gravity. Small lightweight particles could be trapped within this field, effectively levitating. By adjusting the sound waves, they could then manipulate the levitating particles, moving them around in three-dimensional space. But their work didn't stop at levitation and manipulation. Incredibly, they also demonstrated that it was possible to use acoustic levitation to assemble particles into a larger structure, all without any physical contact. This modern exploration into the realms of acoustic levitation may seem like a leap from our ancestral knowledge, but it's just the beginning of our journey into the fabric of the cosmos. Tag along! Okay, 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 okay. That's enough of pictures. I'm too lazy to make any more. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. Welcome back, guys. It's been uh, seventh, uh, seventh, seven months since uh, part one of quantum frequencies. So uh, here it is. Uh, I hope you will uh, like it. Um, also, I'd like to mention, I bought a really cheap. Oh fuck! I see a little corner up here. Bought up green screen. Now I see a little corn. Okay, I gotta fix that. Be right back. Okay, okay, much better. As I was saying, I bought a. B <laughs> I can't talk. I bought a cheap green screen, and uh, I mean, it seems to be all right. So uh, a lot of fun. This means I can put myself, like, crop myself out, put myself in the corner, into the video, like, into an uh, ocean or. Uh, in space, it's uh, technology. Speaking of technology, quantum computing. Let's talk about it. That should be my catchphrase. Let's talk about it. As I was saying, let's shift our focus to quantum computing. These advanced computers operate based on quantum mechanics principles, the same principles that govern the behavior of atoms and particles. They promise computational power far beyond our current supercomputers revolutionizing everything from cryptography to material science. The potential of quantum computing to perform previously impossible calculations is not just a technological leap, it's a dive into the fundamental nature of reality. I'm going to simplify quantum computing as much as I can. Essentially, quantum computing employs actual particles controlled by electromagnetic fields. By manipulating these fields, scientists can target specific electrons, referred to as qubits, a quantum version of the bits in traditional computing. 
Adjusting the spin, energy, and other properties of these qubits allows them to process information in unique ways. The technicalities of this process involve extremely low temperatures and uh, an intricate technology, to say the least. The key aspect of quantum computing to grasp is that qubits are not limited to being just a zero or a one, or on and off, like the bits we're familiar with in standard computers. Due to the peculiar nature of particles, they aren't just in one state or another, like spin up or spin down, particle or wave. Instead, they exist in a state known as superposition. This means each qubit can hold exponentially more information than a regular bit. I believe that in the future, combining quantum computing with AI could be the key to precisely determining the exact frequencies of different objects or materials. Once we achieve this, we could theoretically create counter frequencies that allow objects to defy gravity, phase through barriers, or perhaps even teleport. While it might sound like science fiction, the physics of sound and matter suggests that it's hypothetically possible. We know today that we can make these smaller objects levitate using sound. Uh, acoustic levitation, that is. The reason for me kind of for seeing exactly how we will go from that to being able to levitate larger objects like a person, a car or megalithic stones is just to kind of let you know that this isn't just a sci-fi hypothetical theory. It is actually very plausible uh, in the future that we will be able to 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 do such a thing. My guess is that <coughs> we will have quantum computing and AI to thank for that. And what I want to explore in this video later on is if this technology has existed in the past, uh, in the ancient past, and if it could uh, even explain mysteries of how the Great Pyramid was uh, built, for example. Uh, I hope you'll stay, because maybe we'll find out. Before we head into the past, I'd like to just touch on the fact that, besides levitating small objects, the science of sound and vibrations is making groundbreaking advances in various fields. So let's explore some of these revolutionary applications that are reshaping our understanding and capabilities. In the field of healthcare, acoustic tweezers are a game changer. They use sound waves to isolate tiny biological particles revolutionizing non-invasive disease diagnostics and treatment monitoring, particularly in the fight against cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. This acoustic approach presents a leap forward in precision medicine. They can basically kill tumors with the use of sound and vibration. New research is ongoing for understanding the structural dynamics of insect wings or ant legs without even touching them. Turns out, sound levitation is making this possible. By studying these natural structures, researchers are developing new nature-inspired materials for industries like construction and defense. I love it when we follow nature's architecture to build better things. Nanotechnology and drug delivery. In the realm of nanotechnology, high-frequency sound waves are opening doors to advanced material creation and drug delivery. This could lead more to effective treatments, targeting ailments right at their source. Revolutionary medical devices. Soundwave technology has birthed an innovative nebulizer capable of delivering immunotherapies and large molecule drugs efficiently. This breakthrough signifies a new era in medical treatment delivery, making it more effective and less invasive. Enhancing acoustic technologies. A major breakthrough in preserving the integrity of sound waves promises to refine technologies in ultrasound and imaging and sonar. This advancement underscores the ever-growing potential of acoustic applications in various technological domains. And I can just imagine how sound technology is evolving military weapons and so on. Also, just a fun fact about your common noise reduction earphones. These devices are a brilliant application of the principles of sound interference. 
If you remember, in the first episode, I mentioned that when two sound waves of the same frequency meet in opposite phases, meaning one's peak aligning with the other's trough, they cancel each other out, a phenomenon known as destructive interference. This is precisely how noise-canceling headphones work. They listen to the ambient sounds in your environment and then produce a waveform that is the exact opposite or inverted of those sounds. When these opposite sound waves collide with the noise, they cancel it out, creating a much quieter environment for the listener. This technology doesn't just reduce ambient noise, but effectively erases it, providing an isolated audio experience. It's a perfect illustration of how our understanding of sound and vibration can lead to practical, everyday solutions, transforming a simple concept into an indispensable modern convenience. I don't know if you guys remember, but in the last episode, in part one of Quantum Frequencies, I mentioned uh, towards the end of the video something uh, about Randall Carlson, an appearance he had made on uh, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, uh, where he talked about this plasma technology. He started talking about it because he, uh, he and Joe Rogan were talking about uh, ancient sites like the Great Pyramid of Giza, stuff like that. They were speculating on how it was made. He had his theories on, on uh, like technology using sound. The things that I'm kind of exploring in this video. And uh, he mentioned that he and uh, a colleague of his, Malcolm Bendel, was working on or had already invented a technology that they called plasmoid technology. And you know, you don't have to be a conspiracy nut to to know that if you would have invented something groundbreaking, solving energy problems and such, uh, going against the big corporation, the oil companies and so, you'd be in a, a lot of danger. So I remember Randall Carlson mentioning that he had, uh, they had planned for this exact thing. They had patented in secrecy seven years ago uh, and would release this technology all over the world at once for free. It all sounded so good. Too good to be true, of course. But I had my hopes up. I had my hopes up because as I'm doing in the in this video and the last one is like make trying to make sense of something. Uh, how how a certain technology would be able to work and uh, proving it that it would be possible. I had that same feeling with this plasma technology when he mentioned it briefly how it worked. It felt like, hmm, that sounds almost like the thing that I have been thinking about, you know? So it was a sort of a confirmation bias for me. Now that I think about it, it's, it's like, how the f*** I fall for that? So what I wanted to mention now is that that entire thing was a big scam. And I mean, I hadn't heard about it until now, because uh, I went through the part one and uh, to just make sure that I would uh, cover all the things that I said I was going to cover, and I was like, oh, right, the Randall Carson thing, the plasma technology, whatever happened to that? Checked it out, I saw that Joe Rogan had put the, that episode down, so I couldn't find any footage of it. Uh, and also, in another video, I can show you right now. Dude, I can't wait for this thing to finish. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I've had a few of those. I've had a few that weren't released. Because the person was like a con artist. And I realized like oh, while no they shit. were talking that they were full of shit. Oh, yeah. no shit. I had one of those pretty recently. Um, yeah, you you got to know. I mean, sometimes people are just playing you. And it's a scam. You know, and, and you, you realize like well, this guy can get this information out. This could potentially harm people who want to invest in his bullshit idea. You know, and and then you find out the person has a, a long history of being a scammer. You're like, okay, I can't, I can't have this one. But <laughs> so yeah, it turns out Joe Rogan was actually talking about that specific uh, episode with Randall Carlson. Turned out to be an entire controversy that I totally missed. And the dude that Randall Carlson unfortunately put his trust in, Malcolm Bendel. Uh, I 
put some articles and fed it to ChatGPT to just explain a little bit about him. It said, The information you found about Malcolm Bendel suggests a history of ambitious claims and projects, some of which have been met with skepticism. In the case of the Great South Land Minerals project in Tasmania, Bendel claimed to have had a vision from God about finding oil in the state, asserting the presence of substantial oil reserves. Despite his confidence and the investment of significant time and money, including from investors, the project did not yield expected results. So, right off the bat, crazy guy that uh, makes the people around him poor. And uh, it turned out to be the same case with this plasma technology shit show. And so a lot of people and investors, probably fans of Randall Carlson, mostly fans, I would assume, um, lost a lot of money for nothing. And uh, as of now, it hasn't been officially scrapped, which is weird. Uh, so I don't know how they'll recover from this. This uh, Malcolm Bendel guy, I think he'll just keep on hustling and scamming people. But for Randall Carlson... It's such a shame that he got fooled by this, because uh, he's a great geologist. He's uh, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, geologist alive today, with most experience. If you have a question about how the temperature was in Baghdad one million years ago, he knows it, or he can interpret the data. Extremely long story short. Sorry for that. We skip the plasma technology, nothing to see here. Let's do what I have wanted since part one, actually. And that is to delve into the ancient cultures, uh, specifically symbols and how they give us a hint on the knowledge that people had back then of the structure of our universe, fractal patterns and more. <laughs> Delving into the archives of ancient cultures, we encounter an array of profound symbols that seem to speak to a deeper understanding of the cosmos. An understanding that aligns remarkably well with modern scientific findings. Symbols such as the Flower of Life, Star of David, Jin and Jan, the Kabbalah of the Tree or the Tree of Life, and many others. Intriguingly, these symbols bear a striking resemblance to fractal patterns. Fractals, in their simplest definition, are structures that exhibit self-similarity patterns that repeat themselves at all levels of scale, from the microscopic to the macroscopic. A spiral galaxy, a tree branching, a snowflake, all these are fractal in nature. They can be considered infinite, as one can zoom in or out indefinitely, discovering the same pattern over and over again. This intriguing property of fractals has led some scientists to propose that our universe itself might be fractal in nature. All this science and uh, philosophy makes me feel the urge to put on some glasses. So it would be easier for me to continue. Okay. I assume that those scientists who doesn't claim the universe to be fractal do so because a true fractal would repeat itself precisely at some point. Though I will just say it here, I think that boils down to semantics a bit. But I'd say it as a fact, the universe is fractal in its nature. Now maybe not fulfilling the exact requirements per the definition, it follows similar patterns from the small to the big. We've all seen pictures uh, comparing our neuron network in the brains compared to the entire universe or the background radiation of our universe and how similar that is. Our moon spins around our Earth, which spins around the Sun, which spins around the center of our galaxy, which happens to be a black hole. And uh, also every galaxy has a black hole in its center. It's kind of like the clockwork uh, or, or a machine that spins everything. The reason why everything is moving so fast. Now this goes on to clusters. A cluster is, uh, well, it's maybe a million or billion galaxies clustered together, which then in turn form superclusters. And this might be going on for how many levels, you know, we, c we don't know. 
And also, we can't see further than the start of the universe, the Big Bang. We can see the, the light from it. We can see the background radiation. And it's also with how gravity works. Every black hole, every sun, neutron star, whatever that's in the fabric of space, that's in the universe, everything distorts the fabric of space. The gravity distorts it. And so we don't know exactly if we are looking one way, if that space or that fabric of space at the furthest down our path is so curved, crooked or distorted that what we see is an illusion. And so there's tons of dilemmas with this. We will never be able to physically, with any tool, see the entire universe. If that's even a concept, maybe it is, re maybe it is really um, infinite. But the cool thing with fractals is that you can actually have a finite system that is infinite. I could have a fractal here. You know, just imagine a spiral that just continues like tree branches just forever. You could have, you have the boundaries here, which is this big, but you can have information stored that goes on forever. And that is actually how I have thought of the universe for a long time. Um, and also a reason why the fractal universe just makes so much sense in every way. For some this might sound like a reach, but for me and many scientists it is very logical. Thanks to solid established physical rules we know a lot about how the universe works. Entropy and the formation of atoms, molecules and more tell us that the universe is always trying to do or use as little energy as possible, or better, it it is, it is always trying to achieve a state of minimum energy or maximum efficiency. But why is the universe doing that? Is that just how it is, or is there a logical reason there as well, if you really think about it? I'll explain it this way. If you believe in evolution, which is heavily backed by real science and thorough tests, simulations and logic. Now, I know there are some who debate about the exact evolution on macro objects like animals and humans and such, how fast it happens, uh, etc. But we're not going to go into that. The key lesson to learn of evolution is this. That which works, survives. What don't work will eventually disappear. So it isn't that the DNA figures out which trait is good. It is that the good traits are the ones that survive and therefore can continue down the lineage. And this, of course, is called natural selection. Many people that claim to be Darwinists or believe heavily in evolution often confuse this part. What I believe is that evolution is a logic that covers everything in the universe and things don't have to have a memory or genes for it to work. What I mentioned shortly about some of the universe's logics, chaos is one of those. Chaos exists, which basically means that anything that can happen, will happen. So, a little theory here. First, there was nothing, a void, an infinitely small point, and then a big bang. Why a big bang? Because chaos. Obviously, the possibility of this bang, or matter that went into this nothingness, is a fact, because, well, we're here. Therefore, it happened. Because there was no time before the universe, it also happened instantly. But maybe the very first iteration of the universe, meaning our universe, is likely not the first one, and the only one. Well, maybe that was just a little spark, which died. Then again, something happened, and again, and again. The universe kept springing up and dying. But sometimes, more universes, lived longer than others. And after an insane amount of times, the universe managed to create electrons, protons, neutrons. All thanks to time and chaos. And this happened to work, which is why our world, our universe, is composed of these particles. So why this long-ass explanation? 
Well, the same reason for the universe to be energy efficient, to have chaos, is the same reason that fractals exist. Because it works, it follows Newton's laws of thermodynamic, it is energy efficient, and so on. But I mean, imagine this. If you were to make an AI game that would be self-developing, with a sort of evolution in it, it would be wise to have something similar as fractals. Because that would save tons of energy, information, and processing power. That it would follow a pattern. So when people say that we're living in a simulation, which has become very popular to say these days, or that the universe behaves just like a game, computer code is found in our DNA, particles and the laws of the universe are similar to that of code or rules in games. While it is of course probable that that could be the case, we can't forget that the reason programming, code and so on even works is because it is invented inside of this universe, which already has that similar logic to it, because it is fractal. I know I'm using the word fractal a bit too much in this video, but for me fractal also means what the ancient alchemists said, as above, so below. But the universe might not only be fractal geometrically, but logically, maybe even consciously. Because even the stock market follows a pattern, and cities always turn out following the Fibonacci sequence in some sense. And cities are built by people who think and uh, calculate, which gives an argument that even our minds, our thoughts and so on, follows a pattern. Which I hope uh, not is true, but who knows. So, I've covered sound and vibration as good as I can, and the technologies arising and already implemented in society today, to touching a little bit on quantum computing, and eventually going through fractals, and how important or essential these types of structures, geometric shapes or behavior is to the mathematical universe of ours. All because I really think it is necessary for us to be able to answer the questions I've got coming up, and even for us to make educated guesses or speculation on the mysteries coming up. And uh, that is really what this channel is about, so hang tight and let's go. I love the topic of ancient knowledge, but that term is kind of thrown around a bit these days. But uh, everything I've tried to cover in this video, especially revolving sound, vibration, frequencies and ancient symbols, is for me a hint of a lost ancient knowledge, truly. You could say that the reason these symbols also happen to have these mathematical properties to them is just a coincidence. But time and time again we are disproved of that mindset. Ancient civilizations around the world knew a lot about math and astronomy. Even exact cycles and orbits of heavenly bodies. Some of the phases of statues found in Egypt are 100% symmetrical. Or following the Fibonacci sequence, which is something we can only do today with machinery and laser. I think it's time we stop pretending that everything is just a coincidence and start entertaining the idea that advanced knowledge has been lost and that people before us weren't as primitive as we thought. I truly believe we've gone through several resets or mass extinctions of mankind, leaving only a few to start again. And who knows how far each era of mankind had came in their evolution and technology before the end came to them. Our exploration of ancient symbols reveals potential connections to modern scientific concepts. These symbols, rich in historical and cultural meaning, might represent more than just spiritual or decorative elements from ancient civilizations. They could be a profound representation of scientific knowledge, important and fundamental knowledge. Just as an allegory or a story can be a way of storing culturally important information through generations, 
without people forgetting it. These statues, carvings, and so on of these sacred symbols would serve as a time capsule of essential wisdom for the grandchildren of their time. I sometimes think of it going down like this. The scientists and thinkers of the ancient world would find these important details of reality. Say for example, the Fibonacci sequence, how everything in nature follows it. They would then create art or illustrations with exact dimensions and ratio to say, hey, don't you fucking miss this, this information will be important for your evolution. And with time, of course, so many clues were mistakenly interpreted as something divine, magical, or religious. I say we focus more on trying to find the true meaning of clues from the past than to say everything is just cults, religions, and magical stories with no important information to be found. Found in numerous cultures worldwide, the flower of life, with its evenly spaced, overlapping circles forming a flower-like pattern, is more than an artistic motive. Though it has of course always been a symmetrical and mathematical holy symbol, the true information it hits hasn't been found since recently, I believe. Physicist Nassim Haramein's research suggests that the vacuum you see out in space and also the vacuum that every atom mainly contains of, isn't empty as previously thought, but filled with energy. But we know that the big stuff is made out of the small stuff. So there must be something that connects the two. There must be a way to understand the whole thing with one fundamental theory and I start to drill into the physics to try to find it. And so I, I look at s galaxies, and of course they're made out of stars, and, and uh, molecules are made out of atoms, and so I kept on drilling, and sure, you know, stars and black holes exist in galaxies, stellar black holes and so on, and supergalactic black hole, and at the quantum level, there's the nuclei of the atom and subatomic particle. And when we drill really down to it, we find that all this is baiting at the quantum level into a field that we call the quantum vacuum fluctuation. That is an electromagnetic field that's fluctuating extremely intensely at the very, very fine grain. And when I looked at black holes, I realized that when we solve the equations for black holes, they actually are going towards infinity within the center part that's called the singularity. And Nassim's mathematical results show that the vacuum of space is organized in a pattern resembling a 64 tetrahedron grid. This grid, when circumscribed by spheres, forms the exact pattern of the flower of life hinting at a deeper cosmological significance and a potential source of untapped energy. As stated before, this symbol is found everywhere, with my favorite two sites being at the Assyrian temple in Abydos, which I've covered before, and the other is under the poles of the food dogs at the Forbidden City in Beijing, China. An ancient Hindu symbol representing the union of the divine masculine and feminine. Its interlocking triangles are arranged in a precise pattern that echoes the harmonics of sound vibrations and the structures that arise with experiments on cymatics, suggesting an ancient understanding of resonance and its role in the structure of reality. In the mystical aspect of Judaism, the Kabbalah Tree of Life represents a journey to understanding the universe and the human soul. With its interconnected nodes, the Tree of Life aligns with modern network theory and physics, symbolizing the interconnected nature of all things, from neural networks to cosmic structures. The Kabbalah Tree of Life consists of 10 spheres, sephirots, connected by 22 paths, representing different aspects of God's creation, consciousness and the journey of the soul. Similar to the Norse mythology's nine worlds, connected by the world tree Yggdrasil, representing different realms of existence and beings, 
where both systems symbolize the structure of the universe and spiritual principles, I just can't help but to think of what modern string theory says about how many spatial dimensions there are. 9 to 11 dimensions, with discussions around if time should be counted as a dimension or not. Me personally, I don't think it should. I see time only as movement and relativity of that movement. Just a fun fact by the way, when making images with text-to-image AI mid-journey, the prompts usually sound something like this. Create an ultra-realistic photo of a carving of Yggdrasil. But sometimes, when I just want to be creative or wanted to surprise me, I prompted like this, your interpretation of. And so I did that with a sentence in my script, namely, your interpretation of the interconnected nature of all things. And in most of those amazing images, it involved a tree. Something I found pretty cool. I'm not saying that that is mysterious or anything. It just shows that the symbol of the tree is a deeply rooted and a collective understanding of interconnectivity. Examining ancient symbols with our current understanding of the universe's structure and what we find from the studies of sound reinforces the idea that the ancients were aware of these concepts. But symbols alone don't tell the whole story. What additional evidence can we uncover from the past? As we transition from the realm of ancient symbols to the rich tapestry of traditions, we uncover layers of knowledge pointing towards a sophisticated understanding of sound, vibration and the structure of the universe. The Aum sound, originating from Hindu and Buddhist traditions, is considered the sacred sound of the universe. The precise origins of the Aum sound are difficult to date, but it's deeply rooted in ancient Indian spiritual texts, including the Vedas, which are among the oldest sacred scriptures of Hinduism, dating back to around 1500 to 1200 BCE. The Aum mantra is mentioned in various Upanishads, which are ancient Indian mystical texts. The Aum sound symbolizes the essence of ultimate reality or consciousness. Sorry for my pronunciation of the Aum sound. Aum encompasses all words and sounds in human language, representing the beginning, duration and dissolution of the universe. It's used in meditation and prayers, aiding in achieving a higher state of consciousness. The purpose of chanting Aum is to connect with the divine and the universal vibrational energy fostering peace, enlightenment, and a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of all existence. What's fascinating regarding the sound and how it partially symbolizes the beginning or creation is when you hear that scientists detected this omnipresent noise using radio telescopes targeting the cosmic microwave background radiation, which I touched on earlier, likening it to the sacred Om chant in Hinduism, symbolizing creation's vibration. According to these findings, we now know what the Big Bang sounded like. The same sound monks have been chanting for thousands of years. But, talking about coincidences though, this specific one could actually be just that. A coincidence. What surprised me a lot is the fact that bells were so common back in the days, not only for churches, they were everywhere. And some of them were huge, and the importance of them were crucial for people. They were said to be healing to the body, similar to the traditions revolving gongs. So ancient people carried a lot of respect to the properties of sound. And the healing part? Turns out to be true. There have been several studies examining the impact of sound frequencies, like those produced by bells and gongs, on the body and the brain. Research in fields like psychoacoustics and sound therapy has shown that certain frequencies can positively affect human and animal physiology, promoting relaxation, reducing stress, 
and even improving healing processes. These frequencies often align with those used in ancient sound practices, supporting the idea that ancient wisdom about sound's healing properties has a basis in modern scientific understanding. One notable frequency studied for its healing properties is 432 Hz, often associated with nature's resonance and believed to induce a state of relaxation and harmony. Research suggests that listening to music tuned to 432 Hz can reduce stress and promote emotional tranquility. A popular frequency is 8 to 14 Hz, also called alpha waves, where there are several studies showing the benefits. Similarly, the solfeggio frequencies, like 528 Hz, known as the love frequency, has been explored for their potential to repair DNA and foster positive transformations in health and well-being. There's also this concept known as the Schumann resonance, often described as the Earth's heartbeat, which averages around 7.83 Hz. This frequency is a result of electromagnetic waves in the Earth's atmosphere, and has been studied for its impact on human health and behavior. I would imagine that this frequency is beneficial for us, because we have evolved within it. But if we are constantly adding frequencies and radiation around us through technology, must that not have an effect on our well-being? That isn't far-fetched, in my opinion. While doing this video, I also learned that in the past, music was often tuned to a natural resonance frequency of 432 Hz. This tuning standard was purposely changed to 440 Hz in the 20th century, not so long ago. A shift that some argue disrupts the natural harmony and impacts listeners differently. And well, the bells, which were literally everywhere in societies of the past, they have been taken down and is today a very rare sight. I won't speculate on why that is, if certain people in the world want us more vulnerable, weaker, more in need of medicine, maybe less intelligent, therefore making certain people rich and safe, because stupid people want to know they're being controlled. Now I can feel myself falling into that trap, that rabbit hole, but not, not today. Today we dream. And by the way, <coughs> while doing this video, I've uh, gotten sick, so if my voice sounds different, that's why. And so, uh, <laughs> that's why. By the way, as I've said before, since I was very young, I've always thought about life, uh, the universe, and all of its mysteries. But also, I've always tried to come up with theories. I wanted to be like Einstein when I was little. I wanted to co come up with a theory that uh, would explain these complex and famous problems. And I can remember when I first thought to myself, hmm. Everything in the universe, like planets, galaxies, a rock, a table. What if that is just the fabric of space that is shaped and moving in a specific way that makes that illusion? Then when I was making this video, I found this quote from Erwin Schrödinger. And hell, what a nice quote. What we observe as material bodies and forces are nothing but shapes and variations in the structure of space. And when you think about it, that means that the only thing necessary for our universe is just this fabric of space, whatever that is, and movement. Because with movement, or let's call it vibration, you get time. Because you have difference in movements, you know, if something starts to move, there must be a difference to when that moved. Uh, okay, sorry. Well, that was trash. What I'm saying is that if you really think about it with Schrödinger's idea and uh, mine, <laughs> uh, all you need for a universe to work would just be the fabric of space itself. And that that fabric of space is moving. When you have those two things, you'll naturally have time. Because if you think about it, if you think about an ocean, which, which is, in some sense, one thing, but it contains different, different sort of things. It contains different waves, for example. If you have one wave here that's doing a motion, and you have one wave here, 
this difference between these waves will create the illusion or just it will create time so you need a fabric you need you need it to be moving or vibrating and then you have time and this is what i think is the holy trinity of the universe well i'm not going to go into that now it might be interesting to know that in uh, physics we say that the universe has four fundamental forces four i almost did this and uh, they are the gravitational force the electromagnetic force and that's acts uh, between charged particles like uh, electrons uh, and all that jazz. Uh, weak nuclear force, uh, which is uh, the thing that causes radioactive decay and is essential for nuclear reactions within, within stars. The strong nuclear force is the strongest force. It binds protons and neutrons together in atomic nuclei. Kind of reading of the script here. And uh, as far as I know, the gravitational force is the, the weakest one. But in my mind then, we only need two things, really. The third, which is time, will more be like a result or the effect of the first two things. Uh, please comment what you think about that idea. It might just be ridiculous. Moving on from my extremely deep mind, I seem to always mention something from the Bible. So here I'll go again. One notable story comes from the biblical account of the walls of Jericho, where the sound of trumpets caused the walls to collapse. And similarly, legends from various cultures suggest that chanting, music or specific sound frequencies were used to levitate and move massive stones during the construction of ancient monuments, including some Egyptian pyramids and megalithic structures. I will mention one more thing that I find very intriguing, namely crop fields. Exploring crop circles reveals fascinating connections to sound, vibration and ancient symbols. Some crop circles feature designs that closely resembled sacred geometry and patterns produced by cymatic frequencies. And by the way, the term sacred geometry is also a term I'm quite bored of, but essentially all of these patterns we have gone through, from cymatic and vibrational patterns to ancient symbols, fractals and so on, goes under sacred geometry. Anyway, while debates continue over the origins of these circles, certain crop circles exhibit extraordinary precision and complexity, even appearing overnight. And intriguingly, analyses have shown changes in the magnetic properties of soil and crops within these formations, suggesting an influence beyond mere physical manipulation. Now, this isn't anything that has been made in ancient times, but fairly recent, and is still ongoing as far as I know. The question here is whether or not humans have made them, or if aliens have. If aliens have made them, there must be a reason for why they would construct these specific patterns and symbols. Almost as if they want us to know something, or to tell us something. Before I end this episode, I just want to touch on something. Something I'd uh, like for you guys to comment about, if you'd like. Uh, but anyways, uh, in the Bible, and actually some other holy texts, there isn't just a story of the walls of Jericho describing uh, these trumpet sounds I mentioned earlier. There's three more stories, and one of them is the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, 16, 19. When God descends on Mount Sinai to give the Ten Commandments to Moses, the event is accompanied by the sound of a very loud trumpet blast that grows louder and louder. This sound symbolizes God's presence and the solemnity of the moment. If we take paleocontact theory, this event could be similar to that of when a helicopter is landing, or a flying saucer perhaps. That sound would definitely get louder and louder the closer it gets. And for an ancient man like Moses, it would be very hard to describe what it would actually be. In the book of Revelation, trumpet sounds are associated with the end times and God's judgment. 
Seven trumpets are sounded by seven angels, and each trumpet blast brings about a different apocalyptic event. Revelation 8 to 11. And for fun, let's just continue on that track. This could be bombs, advanced warfare, etc. Nuclear war? I don't know. And there's also the rapture and the second coming. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. The Apostle Paul describes the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. With the sound of the trumpet of God. At which the dead in Christ will rise first. Followed by those who are alive and remain. To meet the Lord in the air. And this is the famous rapture, rapture story. Which I just can't understand what it would be symbolically. I guess the Christians would say it's of course... It of course has happened. And that it is a prompt for people to be good. So that they will get sucked into heaven. Or... This could be a classic beam me up Scotty. But with thousands of people. And just to be clear. I don't believe in any of this. But every goddamn religious text, ancient texts, from tribes to Africa to Mesopotamia or the ancient Greeks, describes this cataclysm, this big cataclysm. And they also describe a sort of war in the heavens. In the Bible we have the war in the heavens uh, between the angels and the dragon. And the dragon symbolizes Satan, I believe, or just e evil incarnated. And in Sumerian texts we have the brother Enki and Enlil fighting. <clears throat> and also the Ijiji fighting against the Anunnaki. And uh, the Ijiji uh, was like the working class f of the Anunnaki of some sort. But uh, back to the trumpet sounds. And again, I just want to touch on this just a little bit before we go. Because I remember first seeing these clips on TikTok or Instagram of people filming when they earthquake in Turkey happened not so long ago. It sounds like something electric or uh, like a vibration, a frequency, like static. Crazy. These extremely loud uh, sounds emerged in the sky. And these really sounded like trumpets. So religious people... Wait a minute. Swedish... Swedish snooze. So... So religious people were going crazy about the end times and so on. And then I searched more about it and found uh, that it had happened throughout the world as long as people's, people have had phones uh, with cameras on it. A catastrophe would be happening, and this insane trumpet sound would be heard from thousands of people. And there real, really were hundreds of videos of this. It still are. Um, and they say history repeats itself. And maybe this is scarily true. It was described in the past uh, as God who gave the judgment. But the he Hebrew word for God is either Jehovah or Elohim. I think Jehovah is a character... It's one dude, a, a general of the Anunnaki. Uh, but Elohim actually is plural in ancient Hebrew, meaning the mighty ones, <coughs> which changes the entire meaning of the Bible. So in my mind, actually, we're talking about the Anunnakis. Uh, did these ancient aliens have this advanced warfare that could bring about catastrophes like earthquakes, tsunamis and the end of the world? And whether modification today isn't science fiction, there's actually a company that can do this. And probably more than we could possibly imagine, I think. I'm talking about HARP, of course. And their official description is this, for those who don't know. The primary purpose of HARP is to understand the ionosphere's behavior and its impact on communication and navigation systems. This includes studying how the ionosphere affects radio signals and how changes in the ionosphere alter the propagation of these signals. <coughs> now, Nikola Tesla had a patent which was called Earthquake Machine or something like that, which was never revealed to the public. It was seized when they took everything from his home and office. And today people are saying that 
harp has this technology, or at least that they have the technology to make earthquakes. What I was thinking, anyways, was that maybe using this extreme energy, which harp is using with their equipment to millions or billions of particles in, in the ionosphere, maybe that causes this trumpet sound. Or if there really is a, a earthquake machine, maybe that machine produces this sound. This end times sound. So what if this ability to create earthquakes really exists, but is ancient technology which was once used and was the catalyst for the cataclysm that ended the last era of men, making us all start all over again. Maybe we are getting close to the end of this cycle. Me personally, I think the last era ended roughly 12,000 years ago. That one I'm actually sure about. The, the other speculation? Um, let's not be that cynical. Let's be positive. Anyways guys, I hope I made it clear with uh, why the study of sound is actually really important. I think it could be the key for many solutions, technology and uh, so on. What do you guys think? Are the crop circles uh, that just appear overnight in England, are they clues for us? Or are the ancient symbols that have survived to this day in our cultures, are they clues or just sacred information and knowledge stored for us to never forget. And that it alludes to the structure of the universe and sound. Comment your thoughts, throw shit at me, like the video if you liked it, share it please. But what I want most uh, is uh, comments. Uh, because being this small, small of a YouTuber, every comment just uh, means so much. It makes things just more enjoyable and fun. And uh, of course it helps with uh, the alg algorithm, I suppose. Uh, and just one last question. Uh, I'm talking about the channel here. Should I keep the name Adara? Or is it a good idea to, to change the name? Did, uh, I just thought about it. Do you like the name? Or should I change it? And if if you think it's a good idea to change the, change the name to something... Then brainstorm with me. Give me some ideas. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I'll see you in the next one. Take care. I love you. Bye. <laughs>